Hello everybody, welcome to Nursing Essentials. In today's video, we're going to do a quick review of some NCLEX style questions. So let's get started. Our first question says that a client has experienced pulmonary embolism. The nurse should assess for which symptom which is most commonly reported. Option number one, we have hot flushed feeling. Option two, sudden chills and fever. Option three, chest pain that occurs suddenly. And option four, dyspnea, when deep breaths are taken. Um, right off the back, I would probably eliminate options one and two, um, mainly because uh, hot and flush feeling probably, we're talking about an allergic reaction, not what you would see on a pulmonary embolism. Sudden chills and fever, because it talks more about a, an infectious process, um, like pneumonia, which in this case, the the patient does not have. So what do we need to take away from the question is what is a pulmonary embolism? And we're looking for a symptom, okay? And the question is asking which is the most commonly reported. So now we know we're looking for the most commonly reported symptom of pulmonary embolism. So let's uh, dig in a little bit more on that. Um, you can take away a lot from the name itself pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary, of course, referring to uh, the lungs, so it's going to be uh, affecting the lungs. And an embolism, in this case, um, probably a thrombus that traveled through the circulation uh, and it got stuck in the lungs. Every time you hear the word embolism, it means that uh, it did not originate where it's making uh, the damage. So it actually has to travel from somewhere else and get launched in the uh, probably one of the arteries in the lungs uh, where it's making uh, the damage. So it travels from somewhere else and it gets stuck in the lungs. More than likely in the case of pulmonary embolism, uh, it travels from the legs uh, in the case of deep vein thrombosis. So you definitely need to keep that in mind. Does it only occur in, in the lungs? Of course not. You can have an embolus that originates in the heart and it travels through uh, the circulation and it gets stuck in the brain where it's going to be causing a stroke, all right? Uh, so we can define a pulmonary embolism as the obstruction of one or more pulmonary arteries by an embolic solid, fluid, or gas. And the most common cause of a pulmonary embolism is going to be deep vein thrombosis, like we said before. Now, the most common initial symptom in pulmonary embolism is chest pain that is sudden and onset. Makes sense because if you have an obstruction of one of the arteries in the lungs, you're going to have tissue that is going to become ischemic. Uh, a tissue that is ischemic, that is not getting enough blood, is probably going to start dying. So a tissue that is dying, it's more than likely going to hurt, all right? Um, the next most commonly reported symptom is dyspnea, uh, but the client can also have an increase in respiratory rate. Um, other typical symptoms that you might see in pulmonary embolism include apprehension and restlessness, so presented with tachycardia, cough, and cyanosis. But we are looking again for the most common reported symptom, all right? That's going to be our strategic word for this question. Um, again, we eliminated questions, um, sorry, not questions, um, answer choices one and two because they are probably related to an allergic reaction and an infectious process. And the dyspnea, which is going to be present when you have pulmonary embolism, but not only associated with the breast, okay? Let's actually include a nice mnemonic so that you can remember what can cause a pulmonary embolism and the mnemonic is PE is fatal uh, so that you can remember that PE can be caused by fat, air, thrombus, which is more than likely what happened in this case, um, but also amniotic fluid and less commonly by bacterial and tumor growth. All right, so very important to keep that in mind. PE is fatal. So let's go back to our question. Uh, so because 
answer number one, it's probably more related to an allergic reaction. We're going to eliminate it. And uh, because the patient does not have pneumonia and there is no evidence of an infectious process, we're going to eliminate chills and fever. So number two is out. And because dyspnea, which is going to be present, but not only when you take deep breaths. So we're going to eliminate option four. So this makes uh, option three the correct answer for this question. It's a chest pain that occurs suddenly. Excellent. We're doing good. Let's go ahead and see the next question. And it says that the nurse is given discharge instructions to a client with pulmonary sarcoidosis. The nurse concludes that the client understands the information if the client indicates to report which early sign of exacerbation. Um, and we have option number one is fever, option two, fatigue, option three, weight loss, option four, shortness of breath. All right, so like right off the back in this question, I'm inclined to say that all of these answer choices are actually uh, correct. So how do we approach this question? Though? So the first thing we need to define is what is pulmonary sarcoidosis? Uh, we need to definitely take a look at that. And uh, the question is also asking for the early sign of exacerbation. So we need to look for early signs of uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis. So let's dig in a little bit more. Uh, the name tells you that it's going to be pulmonary involving the lungs. In sarcoidosis, uh, we are going to be thinking of granulomas. All right, uh, so what is a granuloma? You probably heard, uh, or if you haven't, you probably will. Uh, you hear the word granuloma, you think about tuberculosis. Because tuberculosis, uh, when it gets to the lung, our, our, our defense system is going to try to uh, like create a wall around the, um, the tuberculosis so that it doesn't spread. All right, around that bacteria so that it doesn't spread. It forms a granuloma. Granuloma is basically a, um, a mass of uh, giant cells. You have macrophages in there, fibroblasts, lymphocytes, um, you know, all these cells that are trying to keep um, tuberculosis. In the case of tuberculosis, they're trying to keep it in place so, so that it doesn't spread. So they're gonna surround um, the bacteria so that it doesn't uh, go anywhere. But in the case of sarcoidosis, uh, you actually don't have uh, a bacteria or you don't have anything, you know, that the system is going to, uh, you know, try to keep away. It's just uh, an inflammatory process. We're not, you know, sure 100% what causes it. Uh, what we do know is that it causes non-caseating granulomas, which is what you're going to have in the lungs. So. We can define sarcoidosis as a multi-system disorder that is characterized by non-caseating granulomatous inflammation, and it typically manifests with some constitutional symptoms such as cough, dyspnea, anterior uveitis, erythema nodosum, and arthralgia. So right off the back, it looks like we um, all the answer choices are correct, but we are looking for early signs. Of course, and think about it, if you have a mass in the lungs uh, that's probably interfering with ventilation, you are going to uh, probably start getting sh uh, short uh, of breath. So dry cough and dyspnea are typically early manifestations of sarcoidosis. Later manifestations, uh, which you know the client will have, are night sweats, fever, weight loss, and skin nodules. So again, our strategic word here is early. We have a mass that is obstructing the ventilation in the lungs. Uh, think of it as having a, a golf ball in, in the lungs that is not letting uh, the lungs uh, ventilate correctly. So we are going to eliminate options one and three when we go back to our questions, because they're not early manifestations of sarcoidosis. You will have them, but they're not early manifestations of sarcoidosis. And we're going to eliminate the fatigue, which is our, um, 
I believe it's a number two, because this is going to be a secondary symptom that develops because you have impaired lung ventilation or shortness of breath. So first you have the shortness of breath because you cannot ventilate correctly. And because you cannot ventilate correctly, then you are going to become fatigued. So let's go ahead and add in here a nice uh, mnemonic for you to remember uh, the features of sarcoidosis. And it says features of sarcoidosis are grueling um, so that you can remember that you're going to have granulomas, arthritis, uveitis, erythema nodosum, lymphadenopathy, interstitial fibrosis, and you're going to have a negative uh, tuberculosis test or negative TB test. There is granuloma, but there is no TB in this case. So that's how you differentiate uh, sarcoidosis from uh, probably a tuberculosis infection. And of course, you can have gamma globulinemia as well. So features of sarcoidosis are grueling. So let's go back to our question here. Um, because we're looking for early signs, we eliminated fever, which you will have, but it's just not early you might have it later um, we eliminated uh, number two because fatigue is going to be a secondary symptom uh, related to the shortness of breath so remember first you become short of breath and then you become fatigued because of it um, we eliminated eliminated number three because weight loss is also a uh, not an, an early uh, sign of sarcoidosis so that's going to make option number four, shortness of breath, our correct answer for uh, this question. Uh, excellent. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next question here. And it says that we have a, a nurse who is preparing to suction a client via a tracheostomy tube. The nurse should plan to limit the suction in time to a maximum of which time period. All right, so right off the back, we have option number one, five seconds. Option two, 10 seconds. Option th three, 30 seconds. Option four, 60 seconds. Um, we need to define before we uh, take a look at anything else, what is a tracheostomy tube? You need to know definitely what that is, what it looks like. Um, I, th I believe we have a picture I can show you. And the question is asking you, for the maximum time period that you could do uh, suction in on a client with a tracheostomy tube. Um, right off the back, by looking at the answer choices, I would say 60 seconds might be too long to spend on suctioning. Uh, so I'm more inclined to say options two and three are going to be probably your correct answer choices. So let's see. Um, Let's see how to approach this question. Uh, the first thing you need to know is that this is going to uh, be, uh, this question is talking about a suctioning procedure. And in this case, it's being done uh, via a tracheostomy tube. So what is a tracheostomy? Uh, let's define that. It's going to be defined as a permanent or temporary opening, which we call a stoma, in the cervical trachea that is created through a surgical incision below the cricoid cartilage. Okay, I have a picture to show you in a little bit, so we'll see how that looks. Um, the thing that you need to remember when suctioning a client is that hypoxemia can be caused if you um, are using uh, or if you are suctioning for too long. And this can stimulate the pacemaker cells in the heart because, you know, the client might not get uh, adequate oxygenation. Uh, on top of that, you may also have a vasovagal response uh, that can cause bradycardia or a slow uh, heart rate uh, because of the nerves that we have in uh, the neck region. So you definitely want to be uh, careful about that. Uh, Things to keep in mind is that you must pre-oxygenate the client before suctioning and the limit uh, for, the for the suctioning should be 10 seconds. Again, we are focusing here on the procedure of suctioning. You need to remember that during the suctioning, the client's airway is blocked. Uh, so you definitely don't want to spend a lot of time 
uh, suctioning because during this time period, uh, the client is not breathing. That's why I said at the beginning that probably 60 seconds might be too much. Um, but again, five seconds, it's also not enough to remove uh, the secretions from the airway. So this can also help you uh, probably eliminate one of the answer choices that we have. All right, so let's take a quick look at how the tracheostomy actually looks like. As you can see here, you have the stoma or the opening that is created in the neck where we actually insert the tracheostomy tube. So the tracheostomy tube goes into the trachea or the windpipe. And as you can see to the right here, uh, the air goes in and out through this tube and it goes into the lungs, allowing the client uh, to breathe. So what happens when you are suctioning? As you can see here, you are suctioning through the uh, tracheostomy tube. And during this time period, the airway is obstructed, which, you know, which is why you don't want to spend a lot of time suctioning because the client is not going to be breathing during this time period. Uh, you definitely need to keep that in mind. All right, with this in mind, let's go ahead and answer this, uh, this question. Because five seconds is not enough time to remove the secretions, we are going to eliminate uh, option number one. And because 30 seconds and 60 seconds are a lot of time to spend uh, with a blocked airway, we are going to eliminate options three and four, which is going to make 10 seconds, or option number two, the correct answer for this question. Again, I hope this helps. That's going to be it for today. If you guys like this video, um, make sure that you hit the like button. And if you guys have any questions or comments, make sure that you leave it in a comment below. That's it for now, and I'll see you guys on the next video.